chapter number 29 is where we're going to be today. We've been in a series entitled Love and Dating, Love and Dating, and so talking through what does it look like to love and date God's way? How do we how do we date differently as Christians than everyone else? And so we've been walking through that. The first week we talked about just falling in love with Jesus Christ, falling in love with your first love. And then last week we talked about protecting your purity from the story of Joseph. And then today's lesson we will be talking about finding God's one for you, the one that you've all been waiting for. And no, I'm just kidding, you probably haven't. But, but finding God's one for you. Um, let me just say that obviously what we're going to walk through is a biblical passage. Um, we're going to pull some principles out of it. I understand that what we are going to say today is going to make this sound extremely simple. Just like I said last week, um, a lot of what we're going to talk about is not going to be fill in the blank notes. So sometimes I know for those of you who you pick up a handout and you're like, I'm just, I'm just going to fill in the blanks. And then I'm like five months down the road, I'm going to remember everything. A lot of the principles that we're going to be given, giving are going to be underneath those points. And so if you would, uh, maybe take some more detailed notes today. But let's begin reading in Genesis chapter number 29. Um, the passage is technically down through verse 28. For sake of time, I won't uh, make you listen to all of that. But um, I would encourage you to go back and maybe read Genesis chapter number 28 and 29 on your own time. But the Bible says this in verse number 1. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked, and behold, a well in the field. And lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks, and a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And thither were all the flocks gathered, and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep, and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in his place. And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? And they said, Of Haran are we. And he said unto them, Know ye Laban the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said unto them, Is, the, is he well? And they said, He is well. Very good conversation, right? Um, is he good? Yeah, he's good. All right. Uh, behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. And he said, Lo, it is yet high day, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep, and go and feed them. And they said, We cannot until the flocks be gathered together, and until they roll the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. So if you can kind of get a little picture here, Jacob's, uh, these shepherds are standing around and they're like, well, we can't water the sheep until the um, stone is off of the well or moved from in front of the well. And as soon as Jacob sees Rachel, he gets this extra burst of strength like, oh man, Rachel's here, I'm going to show off. And so he moves the stone away, all right? And so now they're able to water the sheep. And Jacob kissed Rachel, so he's coming in pretty hot here, all right? And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. And it came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. And he told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, surely thou art, bone, art my bone and my flesh. And he abode with him the space of a month. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? And Laban had two daughters, and the name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. I'm going to lean a little bit on maybe your previous understanding of this passage and of this story. But as you know, Jacob has this very meaningful conversation with Laban. It ends up that Jacob serves his seven years, and rather than getting Rachel, he gets Leah. 
after um, he finds that out and after, he, after the deceiver is deceived, which that's a whole other lesson in and of itself, but after the deceiver, uh, Jacob, is deceived, um, he serves another seven years to get Rachel. But this verse, that, as I was studying through and thinking about our series, verse number 20 has stood out to me over and over again. The Bible says, let's read it one more time. It says, And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. They seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had under her. And so today I want to spend just a few minutes, minutes, minutes sharing a couple principles from Genesis chapter number 29 and a little bit of Genesis chapter number 28. I've lost those pictures again. I'm sorry, just ignore it because I'm not bending over anymore. All right. Um, but I want to lean on uh, just your understanding and we're going to talk for just a few minutes about finding God's one for you. Let's pray and we'll ask the Lord to help us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. Lord, we thank you for uh, just your faithfulness to us. God, I know that many in this room, they ha this, uh, the dating in their relational life just weighs so heavy on them day in and day out. Lord, it seems like that the culture is working against us. Lord, it works against our purity. It works against uh, just so many of the things in our lives. And God, I ask that you would help them. Lord, help them to date differently. Help them to love differently. And Lord, I pray that there would be a moment in each of their lives that they would be able to look back and they could say that the wait was worth it. Lord, I ask that you give me wisdom as I speak. In your name we pray. Amen. How many of you, you've ever sat in a waiting room for a doctor's appointment or whatever, all right? They're the worst, aren't they? Like, literally the worst. I know some, of, some people try to make them better with TVs and some people try to make them better with magazines. I have not read a magazine, like, in 50 years. Like, and I'm not even 50 years old. So, um... <laughs> So uh, people try to make them better. I know that one of the walk-in clinics that we go to, um, it's, uh, it, has like, it normally has like some sort of kid's show playing. And I, every time I've been in there, I'm like running a temperature. And how many of you, when you run a temperature, like you just get super delirious? Like I think I've told you guys this, that my first memory of actually running a, a fever or running a temperature, whatever you call it, depending on where you're from, okay? But my first memory of that my mom, I was starting to get sick, and my mom, was, my mom was running into Walmart, and I told her I didn't feel good, and she was like, well, let's just run into Walmart, and I remember running, a, like, starting to feel worse, and you remember those big balls that used to be in, like, those, two, those things at Walmart, and they had, like, the bungee cords, and that was the only way you could get them out, but you always wanted to get them out so that you could chuck them over the top, okay? You remember those, and they were, like, kind of tie-dyed and cloudy or whatever? That is what I remember being sick, and that night I dreamed that that ball rolled after me like constant, like the whole night. Like I just kept having that nightmare. Still, as a 31-year-old adult man, when I start to run a fever, I tell Lauren, I'm like, oh, that big ball was rolling after me last night. So, so when I go into these waiting rooms and I'm sitting there and I'm running a fever and there's some kid show on, I'm like, I just know that I'm going to dream about Jungle Book. Like these monkeys that I'm watching are going to be chasing me or whatever's showing. Or, all right? And like I just feel completely out of it. That's the only time I've ever been in there. But waiting rooms are not enjoyable, especially when you are fearful of what's on the other side of it. If you feel bad, if you're there for maybe some sort of diagnosis, if you're there to maybe see what's wrong with you, you are fearful of what is to come on the other side of the waiting room, but you're also not necessarily enjoying the waiting side either. And the truth is, is that sometimes in your dating life, that's exactly how you feel. You're not enjoying the wait, but you also are fearful of the future. You also don't know what the other side of the waiting actually looks like. And in our passage today in Genesis chapter number 29, if you go back to Genesis 28, Jacob has been encouraged by his father Isaac to go and find a wife. Isaac says, it's time for you to go and go out on your own and begin your own family. I want you to go and find a wife. He even tells him where to go. He tells him who to talk to. But what you'll find in Genesis chapter number 28, without us going back and reading, is that Jacob has an interesting experience on his journey to find a wife. He actually says in verse, uh, I'm not going to get the verse right, but he actually says in Genesis chapter number 28, he says, this is surely the place of God, meaning that he had met with God face to face before entering this search for a wife. And here's what I want you to see from today's lesson and really the main important thought of this is that whether you are in the waiting room or whether you're on the other side of it, 
there must be worship that precedes both. Whether you're in the waiting room or you're on the other side of it, there must be a time and a place and a purpose and worship that precedes both. One of the reasons why we get dating so wrong as Christians and one of the reasons why we fall in love with anyone and everyone who passes our way is because we have never fallen in love with Jesus Christ first and foremost. And I think that what you'll find is this, is that Genesis chapter number 29 would look a lot different had Jacob not had a Genesis 28 moment in his life. Genesis 29 would probably not be as spiritually minded had Jacob had not entered into this moment like, it, like he had in Genesis chapter number 28. And for you as a child of God to date and love differently, here's what you have to see, is that you have to see that it does not start with you and it does not start with who you are dating. It starts with your heavenly father. It starts with your worship and your relationship with him. Because if that is solid, Jesus Christ has a way of taking care of the rest. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Meaning this, that if Christ is not your first love, if Christ is not your priority, if Christ is not who you are pursuing in life, then it does not matter how handsome or how rich or how qualified the person you are dating is, you have left and reprioritized to something else. And so with that in mind, I want to give you three principles of finding the one uh, that God has for you. First one is this. Finding the one requires worship. Finding the one requires worship. Let's go back and let's look at Genesis chapter number 28 really quickly. The Bible says this in verse number 15. This is God speaking. He says, And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to, uh, spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon it, up on the top of it. And he called the name of this place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. This is where the tithe is really introduced when he talks, when he says that gives a tenth unto thee in verse number 22. I'm not going to use this as an opportunity to talk about giving. Here's simply what I'm going to use it as an opportunity for. Jacob saw that something was different because of his interaction with God. Jacob was a different man as a result of what he experienced at Bethel. The name Bethel means the house of God. And here's what sometimes we as Christians get mixed up. We want the Christian marriage and we want the Christian family without the work and the duty of building that earlier than we have to. The truth is, is that right now as a young adult, you are telling the rest of the world what kind of spouse you are going to be one day. Guys, you are telling girls what kind of future husband you're going to be. If you're not serving, if you're not, if you're not walking with the Lord already, if you're not already involved in church, if you're using every excuse you can to get out of church, you are telling Christian ladies what kind of husband you will be one day. Ladies, if you are not already serving, if you're not already involved, if you're not already walking with the Lord, if you're not already showing and, and handling yourself as a lady should, then you are showing Christian men what kind of lady you will be. And here's what's so interesting about Jacob, is after he has this encounter with God, he says, this is the house of God, and if God does this for me, I will make him my God. Can I just encourage you with this? Wouldn't it be great if we just went ahead and made God our God already? 
Wouldn't it be great if we walked into the dating life and the dating world and we said, you know what, my faith is not what's up for grabs right here. I'm not going to sacrifice and compromise my Christianity and my relationship with God just to get a cute guy. I'm not going to change who I am just to get a pretty girl. I am solid in my walk with God. And many times, here's what we see. As we see someone begin to date and they have to change who they are and possibly even what they believe to get what they want. Can I just get you to see very simply and biblically that what you need to do is you need to decide who you are and then let that determine what you want. Because finding the one that God has for you begins with worshiping and starting with God, not letting it follow after you've already dated. Secondly, Finding the one not only requires worship, but finding the one requires going. Y'all are not going to like this one, okay? I'm just kidding. It'll, it'll be all right. I'm going to soften it, okay? I'm going to sugarcoat it. I'm going to dip the, I'm going to make it bubblegum flavored medicine for you, all right? Oh, come on. Bubblegum medicine is the best, all right? That's the whole reason I go to the waiting room, all right? Like I told you, it was awful. I'm just, excuse me, I'm just here for my monthly bubblegum medicine, all right? Uh, y'all are, see, I knew we weren't on the same page, okay? Uh, finding the one means going. Sometimes we have a tendency to look at dating as come and get me rather than go and find it, okay? That I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to wait on someone to come and find me. Like, God's will, please come find me, all right? But it's interesting that Jacob actually goes to find what he has been told to search for. He goes to a certain area. He goes to a certain family. He goes to a certain place. He already knows who is there. He already knows what he needs to do. He already knows how to interact with this group of people. And so he goes and finds what he wants and what God has called him to. Now watch this. For you as a child of God, there is a difference and going and finding what you want the way the world says to, and going and finding what God's will is for your life. The world says go out and find what you want, which means go and find the best looking person who could possibly the mo- be the most promiscuous person, who could possibly have the most baggage, who could possibly, like you don't, it doesn't, all of those things get washed away because of what they look like and who they are and, and maybe how they treat you. Here's what I want you to see is there is a difference in going and finding that and going and finding God's will for your life. Meaning this, the difference is the places and the purpose and the people that are pushing you to that point. If someone is encouraging you to go and find what you want in your dating life and in your love life and in marriage or whatever, if the person doing that and encouraging you is someone who's not a godly friend, if they're encouraging you to go places that you should not be going to find someone of the opposite sex to marry, if they're encouraging you to date someone even with possibly some unresolved baggage or some some sort of sin in their life, then watch this. That is not God's will for your life. But if the people encouraging you to maybe pursue someone are godly people in your life and they say, you know what, this is a godly person. I've watched them serve. They're already in a good place. They're already doing what God has called them to do. Then it could be that that is an opportunity for you to go and seek what God's will could potentially be in that moment. If you are having to go and find someone of a, in a way that is not pleasing to God, or you're just sitting back and saying, God, please bring them to me, there is a balance in that. There's going, but there's also a guided going, meaning this. Set your parameters now for where and who you will look for. There's nothing wrong with having those parameters. There's nothing wrong with saying that I'm not going to go maybe and find someone at at a public university. I'm not going to go and find someone maybe wherever. I'm going to find someone in church. I'm going to find someone who's serving. I'm going to find someone who's called into ministry, whatever it may be. These are my parameters, and don't back down from those. Don't find, don't find an excuse to say, well, I'm just going to back up and I'm just going to go and find a, a different route. Dating God's way means this, that you have places and people in your life who can say, here's where your parameters need to be. Here's what needs to be occurring in your dating life. 
And Jacob had the parameter of his parents, which if you still live at home and your parents are godly people and they're encouraging you, then that is a parameter in your life, okay? But he also had the parameter of location, where he was at. It's interesting to me that uh, Isaac said, this is where I want you to go. This is the family that I want you to see. This is what that's going to look like for you. He said, here's the place, meaning this. Wouldn't it be great? I love when I get an opportunity to marry Crosspoint people who met in Crosspoint. Like, that's super cool to me, all right? I think I've done a couple of of y'all's weddings, all right? But that's so cool to me, and here's why. Because you found them in the right place. I'm not saying that, like, if you go and find someone from Alabama, that that's the wrong place, all right? Alabama is in question, but everywhere else is all right, okay? (laughs) But I'm not saying that. Those of you who meet at a Christian college or those of you who maybe meet at a Christian school or those of you who meet at a Bible study at a public university, where are your parameters? Know the places that God has for you, and then don't go and find someone elsewhere, okay? So there is an element of going, but then lastly is this. Finding the one means worship, or requires worship, and it requires going. But lastly, it requires waiting. It requires waiting. I don't know that I can completely comprehend the mind of God in Genesis chapter number 29, of why he would allow someone like Jacob to go and serve for seven years and then all of a sudden end up with the wrong wife. Like, I'm just praying that doesn't happen. If that happens to, like, if, if your future father-in-law is like, whoop, tricked you, here's their sister, like, you have bigger problems than what I can help you with, all right? I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. Don't be calling me for counsel on that one, all right? Like, I'm going to, run, run. But... I don't know that I can figure this out in God's plan. But here's what I believe the principle is. Is that so much of what we do today is just instant. It's there for us. You want to find something? You want to buy something. I can't tell you how many times I've stood in an aisle at Walmart and I've thought, I bet I can find this cheaper on Amazon. And like I pull out my phone. I can't tell you how many times I've thought of something on the way home and added it to my Amazon shopping list or set a reminder or whatever for when I get home. Because we live in such an instant world. And here's what I want you to see, is that God's will is often not accomplished in a microwave, but a slow cooker. You say, I was already hungry, and now you're using food references, okay? We want... God's will to often be, ding, it's ready for you. When many times God is a God of preparation. God is a God that is slow and methodical. And I'm sure it frustrated Jacob. But you know who it really frustrates? People living in 2022 who have zero patience. (laughs) Me too. People who everything that we've ever wanted in this life is there for us in an instant. And there is a waiting side to seeing God's will. I wish I could stand up here and tell you that there were no broken hearts when you date God's way. I wish I could stand up here and tell you that you're going to find the perfect person and it's going to be super quick and it's going to be your sophomore year of college and you're going to have the rest of your life mapped out. Cannot say any of that. But here's what I can say. I've seen very few people follow God's will for their dating life or just life in general that have gotten to the other side of that waiting and thought, I wish I would have done it differently. I wish I would have maybe done it my way. I wish I would have sped things up. I wish I wouldn't have broken up with so-and-so. Because why? Because God's will and God's way is always better going the slow way than it is going the quick way. I use the statement that God's will is accomplished in a slow cooker, not in a microwave. How many of you have ever had a microwave meal? Have you ever had a microwave meal? You're just young adults, so of course you've had a microwave meal. My, I'm, a, I'm a married adult. I have microwave meals, right? But you had a microwave meal. 
How many of you have ever had someone pull a piece of barbecue meat or chicken wings or like a turkey on Thanksgiving off of a slow cooker and they've seasoned it and all this stuff? Like what was that turkey we had at your house for Friendsgiving? That like jalapeno butter jam cherry delight turkey or whatever, right? Like that was so awesome, okay? Now I know that you, and every, you can't slow cook every day of your life. Like, okay, well, it's 6.30 in the morning. Better get the turkey in so that I can have it for supper tonight, all right? But you know what you can do? Is you can trust that God's way is going to be sweeter and better on the other side of that than if you would have done it your way quick and instantly. And sometimes we are so hungry just for the quick get and the quick win that we're willing to sacrifice maybe our overall health. I don't know that I've found too many microwave meals that are super healthy. We're willing to sacrifice maybe our taste. Why? Because we want it now more than we want what's better later. And here's what I want you to see today. Is that Jacob waited seven years to get the wrong wife. Okay? So hopefully none of you are in that boat. He waited seven years to get the wrong one. He waited another seven years to get the right one. But verse number 20 says this, they seemed but a few days because of his love for Rachel. Do you know why they seemed but a few days? I think it was because of Genesis 28. I think it was because Rachel was not his main focus. God was his main focus, and he was willing to wait to get what God wanted him to have. He was willing to go through some difficult moments to get the one that he loved. And if I can just fast forward you in your life a couple of years, right now, there's a heavy burden of dating. There's a heavy burden of no dating, like I don't know any eligible people, okay? Or I do, and I don't like them. Okay. There's maybe the, the pressure of, okay, I've, I've, mom and dad are really breathing down my neck. Like the, I'm 28 years old and I still live at home, whatever. Okay. So-and-so is really, really want me to go out with them, but I don't want to. There's this constant pressure. Maybe there's just an overall discontentment. Like I hate this. Okay. All of those are legitimate feelings, but watch this. Do you know what has a tendency to wash all of those away? is when you get to stand at the marriage altar, pure, excited for what you uh, you have said yes to, and not dreading it, not settling, not saying, you know what, I guess I'm stuck here. Getting to see what God has done in your life. All of a sudden, the days and the months and maybe the weeks of discontentment and loneliness and "Ah, I hate this seem but a few years because you've waited on the one that you loved. And in the midst of the waiting, you chose to worship God above anything else. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's pray. We'll ask God to help.